Welcome one and all to the Massachusetts Historical Society. I'm Charlie Ames, I'm chair of the Board of Trustees, and it's very nice to see so many of you here. A few words about the Society. Founded in 1791, this is one of the finest independent research libraries in the United States. We have a vast and unique collection of paper, art, and artifacts dating back from well before the Revolution. This year, since February, as part of our 225th year, we've been exhibiting our collection of the private papers and drawings of Thomas Jefferson. This program is part of a series related to that exhibition. There will be two more. On May 11, Andrea Wolf will be here to discuss Jefferson as a gardener. And on May 16, Henry Adams will be here to discuss Jefferson as an architect. I hope you'll return for those programs. Tonight, we're delighted to have with us Annette Gordon-Reed and Peter Onuf to talk about their new biography entitled Most Blessed of the Patriarchs, Thomas Jefferson and the Empire of the Imagination. The book was published just two weeks ago to a chorus of rave reviews, including two in the New York Times. Annette Gordon-Reed is a Charles Warren Professor of Legal History at Harvard Law School and the Carol Fortzheimer uh, pr Professor at the Radcliffe Institute for Advanced Study. Among other important books, in 2008 she wrote The Hemingses of Monticello, the first of a two-volume set, subtitled An American Family, which won the Pulitzer Prize for History. She's received the National Humanities Medal and been named a MacArthur Fellow. Peter Onuf is the Thomas Jefferson Foundation Professor of History Emeritus at the University of Virginia and Senior Fellow at Monticello. He's the author, co-author, and editor of many, many books, most recently writing The Mind of Thomas Jefferson in 2007. He's also known as the 18th Century Guy on the weekly radio show, public radio show, Backstory with the American History Guys. In this week's New York Times book review, which welcomed Most Blessed of the Patriarchs to its bestseller list, Annette Gordon-Reed is asked why readers are turning this year to books like the one she and Peter have just written. She replied, and I quote, so many of the bizarre things that have happened raise questions about the fundamental nature of democracy in the United States. Could this have been our destination all along? Maybe people are now, even more than usual, feeling the need to look at, look at how it all got started and are seeking out books that may give them a clue. In the face of uncertainty about the future, people are looking at the past. To an organization devoted to the proposition that the past is fundamental to our future, these words are music to our ears. Together, Annette Gordon-Reed and Peter Onuf are truly the dream team of Jefferson scholars. Please give them a warm welcome. Anyway, it's wonderful to be here with Annette, uh, but we have an enormous burden to show the way to the future for you folks. Uh, it's a little too late for most of us, actually. and. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about what this collaboration means to me, and then Annette, who's the real historian, will then uh, give the uh, origin story w with footnotes, and then, then we'll go on to talk about the book and how we understand it, and then we'll try to suggest some of the big themes that you'll find there if you choose to read it. So. What this book is all about for me is friendship. And you might think this is just human interest stuff, but I think it's very important to the kind of book we were able to write. Because it's based on our distinct interests, and they're very distinct, but finding common ground in this one man, Thomas Jefferson, and trying to understand him a little bit. Uh, maybe, uh, Annette, you could, uh, Tell our story. Tell our story. Yeah. Well, I met Peter in the mid-90s. Um, 
I was working on my first book, Thomas Jefferson and Sally Hemings, An American Controversy, a book, by the way, that I did some research for here at the Massachusetts Historical Society. And I'd written the manuscript um, thinking that I needed to have people who would be dissenters, people who would disagree w with my thesis, which was that the historians who had written about Thomas Jefferson and Sally Hemings had given short shrift to the evidence for the existence of of a connection between the two of them. It was not writing to prove that the story was true, but to say that there was a double standard in the viewing of the evidence. Um, evidence from, you know, from whites, evidence from Jefferson's legal family um, was given sort of a thumb on the scale, and evidence from enslaved people and other people uh, outside of the Jefferson circle, uh, people just sort of didn't credit it. So I wanted to try to give a balanced view of it. So I thought that because he was the Thomas Jefferson uh, Foundation Gonna professor, be that he would be hostile to it. Uh, he's the successor to Merrill Peterson, the successor to Duma Malone. So I sort of assumed that he would not like what I was saying. So he was the perfect person to send it to, because it do, doesn't do very much good to send things to people who are inclined to agree with you, because then you don't really get to see where maybe you're wrong. So I sent it to him, and to my surprise, he liked it and actually championed it and suggested that the University Press of Virginia um, publish it. And I went there instead of with a, another trade publisher that had uh, bid on the book because I thought it was important. The subject matter uh, was important enough and sensitive enough that I wanted people to, to know that it came from an academic press where typically you have a couple of people read the manuscript and vet it uh, before it is actually published. So. That's how we got started, and through all that's happened then, DNA, the Hemings of Monticello, all kinds of things, we've been having sort of a conversation about Jefferson. Right. And he's an intellectual historian. Um, he deals with people's minds and thoughts and, and ideas. And not with people. Not, not with people, <laughs> not with people at all. And I write about people. Uh, my, I'm interested in Jefferson's thoughts and ideas, and I knew a little bit about that, but that has not been the main focus of what I'd been doing. I'm looking at the archive, looking at the farm book, looking at what's going on at the plantation with enslaved people, looking more even at Jefferson as a political figure than you know, going, you know, thinking about um, the people who, who he read and you know, the sorts of things that, that Peter deals with. So when Peter mentioned that he was going to retire, I thought that this was a way to try to stave off, you know, sort of riding in the sunset. Um, that we should do a book together. Um, I'm planning to do uh, a biography of Jefferson, a two-volume biography of Jefferson, and I thought that this was one area that I needed to sort of, you know, bone up on in a way and to get a little bit more knowledge of. So keeping him in the game, uh, mm -hmm. keeping him in my life, and also uh, learning more was the impetus for doing the book together. And so I asked him if he would do it, and he said yes. Well, I never say no to Annette. <laughs> <laughs> the idea of doing a biography is really strange to me, uh, and uh, I never did people before at all. I finally rested on this one person, and I had to do him at UVA, but when I did The Age of Jefferson, it was never about his life. But I have to say, I developed new admiration for the biographical form when I read The Hemingses of Monticello, uh, Annette's great prize-winning second book which, though it's not about Jefferson, well, it is, in a sense, about Jefferson, what's around him, the world he creates for other people, mm -hmm. intentionally and coercively. Mm -hmm. And uh, I thought that was brilliant. And there are larger truths to be gained if you could situate Jefferson in the lives of other people, which Annette did so brilliantly. And that's, I think, a link between the intellectual history and the social history. Mm -hmm. It's those connections. It always seemed to me a waste of time to focus on one person, except locally John Adams, of course, is totally wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think the consensus, if we took a vote, you'd rather see another book about Abigail. Is that true? Should we do that now? <laughs> Exercise of Jeffersonian democracy? For me, history is more serious than that because when you get into biography you either like or dislike you identify with the subject you got some agenda that you want him or her to be a certain kind of person that you can look up to that you can identify with that you can rally around 
And that seemed trivial, because I'm an arrogant, unread historian, and I don't expect people to be interested in what I do. Uh, but uh, Annette offered me a way out of my solipsism uh, by suggesting that you could do a biography that maybe if it drew on our shared talents and interests, might be the kind of biography I'd be proud to be associated with. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we set about, uh, we spent, people ask us how did you do this, because historians usually work alone. Um, sometimes you work as a collaborator. You, he's done work with your brother, his brother. I'm a serial people. collaborator. He's a serial I, collaborator. I've apologized to <laughs> Annette for that, but yeah. there were other he's, collaborators. There were, there were other collaborators, <laughs> yes. Uh, but lots of times people will do one chapter and the other person will do the other chapter. Our editor really wanted us to have one voice uh, to make it read in a coherent fashion. So we spent a lot of time talking before we even sat down to sort of plan the book. Um, he was in Virginia. I was in New York and in Cambridge. Uh, we Skyped a lot. We had sort of a regular Skype sessions. Amanda Sigilski well, is nodding her head. She was my faculty assistant at Harvard until she abandoned me, but that's another story. <laughs> yeah, let's get I'm that out in you. public Let's get now. that out in public right now. <laughs> no, that's not true. It's, it's wonderful. She's acknowledged in the book for keeping us, keep us in order. We'd be nowhere uh, if she hadn't planned everything. Um, so this idea of talking it out, talking and getting uh, our sort of voice together. I listened to a lot of his speeches. I mean, I'd heard a lot of his speeches before, but I listened to a lot of his speeches to try to get the cadence of the way he talks and the way he um, you presents mean things. All, you did this. All yeah. Is that what yeah. you told me? Yeah. Oh, yeah. So, man, this uh, is a revelation. A revelation. I, I should so come I to that. more of these conversations. <laughs> I should come to more of these things. So, in preparation, and then we sat down and we decided that we were not going to do a chronological, you know, and he was born in Chadwell and then, you know, Bishop Mari and then. Party mm -hmm. Carré, and then oh, we hold please. these truths, and Don't then even talk about it, okay. is it the fourth? Yeah. I mean, it was not that sort of run through his life like that, but it is somewhat chronological in a, in, in a thematic way, because we want some coherence to it. But we thought that we should think, look at some of the things that made Jefferson who he was. The idea, we say in the preface, is not to focus on what we think he ought to have been doing in the world, but to try to figure out what he thought he was doing in the world, and we say, where it is at all reasonable to do so, we take him at his word about his intentions and his beliefs. There's a lot, we mm -hmm. say, of, of sort of second guessing that goes on, people sort of appearing wise, to show how wise they are to say, oh, I'm on to you. And so everything is seen in this very, very cynical way. Uh, and that so, sort of so left Je Jefferson scholarship something in, in a ditch almost. I mean, the same thing, hypocrisy, hypocrisy. And that's, a, that's sort of a word that right. shuts the, we in a, an interview that's earlier today. That's the last time you hear that word tonight. Last time, right. well, no, I'm gonna nobody, say it one more time. No. Hypocrisy <laughs> is a, it slams a door. It tells you that it's not worth looking at this person. And so how do you have someone who had the enormous influence that he had that hasn't really been paralleled uh, from his election in 1800 uh, through his you know, successors, Madison and Monroe, a brief moment with JQA, and then Jackson shows up and he considers himself a Jeffersonian. That level of power, that level of influence for that length of time hasn't really been matched. And so how did, he, how did this person turn into somebody that we just say, oh, that's a hypocrite, we don't have to listen to him anymore. So this is, we think, sort of a reboot, we hope, um, another a time to look, ha, look at Jefferson in a different different light. And here's the different light. It starts with a title that our editor didn't like at all. Now he does. Yeah, they do right? like it. You, I think you, they like it now. <laughs> what does this mean, most blessed of the patriarchs? Thomas Jefferson, a patriarch. An antediluvian patriarch? Mm -hmm. That is this, he's supposed to be a great icon of democracy, if I'm not mistaken. He's arguing against this guy up here in Boston or wherever he was, Braintree, that uh, <laughs> Adams was a nut for the English Constitution, only he wouldn't admit it. He's all for aristocracy and monarchy. And You're here to pick a fight, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, uh, Jefferson's the great Democrat. All men are created equal. It says it right here on the Declaration of Independence. How, how can you have that principle of equality coexist with the notion of patriarchy, which is the worst of all things in the world now that we've learned how ineffectual and redundant men are, after all. <laughs> you, yeah, well, yeah. That, that's your lead-in. <laughs> that's I'm agreeing with that, no. 
<laughs> yeah, so he, but he's a patriarch, and he's a patriarch at a time when that is something that is is considered the norm. But in these letters, he write the the first time he we we hear him saying this, um, the, the, from the title "Most Blessed of the Patriarchs," he's writing to Angelica um, Schuyler Church uh, after Angelica's brother-in-law had sort of beaten him up in Washington's cabinet, and he's going home to lick his wounds, and basically, you know, I. I'm leaving and I'm going back to my home and my right. fields and to labor, you know, to watch for the happiness of they, those who labor for mine, enslaved people. And then he says, you know, he's talking about his daughters and if they come li live next to me, uh, I will be the most blessed of the patriarchs. And, you know, so I will consider myself as blessed as the most blessed right. of patriarchs. And he uses the phrase, as Peter said, antediluvian patriarch in another letter. So it's it's sort of odd to think of this person, uh, this sort of biblical-like character, ancient, a figure from ancient times that he sees himself as, and it's a right, very unguarded, right. in some ways an unguarded moment uh, mm -hmm. where he's opening up his understanding of who he is. And so that's, we wanted to try to, as they say in history, unpack that and figure out what is going on here right. uh, uh, with him and how this person adopts this view of an, of an autocrat um, at the same time as he is uh, promoting this idea of a Republican society. It's deeper than just mm -hmm. a, a matter of hypocrisy or a contradiction. Yeah, and I think this is a, a, a good opening to what our larger theme is. When you read that letter carefully, it's a fascinating letter. Uh, he's telling us something about what he thinks means most to him, and that is home and family, even a family that extends to include enslaved people. And he's setting that off against the miseries of politics, as you frequently put it. If you took Jefferson at his word in this case, you'd say, well, the poor guy spent his entire life doing something he really hated, and that wouldn't be true, because I think the first insight we have is, think of Jefferson as somebody whose whole life was dedicated to politics. Now, he wasn't interested in partisan politics. That was a no-no in this period. You weren't supposed to be a partisan. You were supposed to be a devoted Republican interested in the, in the well-being of the people as a whole. He devoted his life to politics and claimed only to be happy at home. But even at home, most of his time, he was doing politics, mm -hmm. except maybe in those three years or so <laughs> when, he, when he went home to lick his wounds after that uh, unmentionable man whose name begins with an H had given him such a hard time. Yeah, yeah, I mean, well, he, he has to, he does politics because one of the things that we talk about is his obsession with the American Revolution and the success of the United States of America. That's what really obsessed Jefferson, not race, not slavery, not the things that we mm -hmm. fixate on. It's, and now, of course, we fix on it because we know what's gonna happen. We know what slavery and race and those kinds of things are gonna do to the country, to the Union, that he fought so you know, strongly for and believed so in, in such strong, you know, with such strong feelings. And he thought that that's what his life was devoted to. And you can't really, we're sort of, we're in a moment when we think that politics, you know, politics is like a dirty word, but you can't really have government uh, without politics. Right. I mean, unless you have a dictator or somebody who, you know, who tells everybody what's going to do. And even then you have, you know, you know mm -hmm. it's sort of sub rosa politics. But politics, it's the warp and woof of, of a government, of an active government. So he had to be in politics. You know, he goes home and there are people who say, well, when he went home uh, for his first retirement that lasts for about three years, people say they take him at his word that he was going to stay out of it. I, I just can't imagine that he really thought that he was going to go home and let Alexander Hamilton and you know those people run the country. Um, he was going to come back into it because he is politicking. Now he's telling Madison, you know, take up your pen, <laughs> you right. know, do you go out and do this? But he af eventually realizes, you know, not too long it didn't take him to realize that he had to do something. There was no way he was going to stay out of the fray because he wanted to do certain things for the government. And then at the end, when He'd done enough, mm -hmm. done what he thought he could do in that particular role. He went home. Right. You know, I mean, he left it, and he continued to to pay attention to all of it. But, you know, he did not like. It was not politics for politics' sake. It's politics because he had helped start a country, and he was going to see 
see it through. And his country was his home, and that's another suggestion that we'd like to take away from this. Politics was a means to an end, and the end was the thing that he cherished most. And this, I think, collapses the distinction. What he wanted to defend was his home. That was the reason he would go out into the big world. And this idea of home, this cherished space, he would defend it because the very idea of a republic is based on the fundamental natural relations between husband and wife, creating families, between families and among families, the whole living generation that makes its own world, that declares its independence. Home, then, is not extra political. It's not in opposition to politics. It's the very core of his political vision. And home is an ideal place. We might think that home, well, for him, would be Monticello. But remember, Monticello is a work in progress throughout its existence. Jefferson is absent much of the time. And for him, it's as much an ideal, a place that should be and could be and eventually would be as it was a lived reality. And it's that abstractness of the idea of home and family values, the families that constitute the nation or the people. That's what he devoted himself to. It began at home. And he was, interestingly enough, someone who was always away from home. I mean, the story is that he's a, at age three, between two and three, leaves Shadwell and goes to live at Tuckahoe, uh, according to a promise, after a promise that his father made to a friend of his. So he's away from his birthplace. Then he comes, when they leave uh, Tuckahoe and come back, he goes to boarding school. He's away from home except on weekends. Then he's off at William and Mary. Um, he has 10 years with his wife. Um, a good number of those years when they're building Mo Monticello, he's at Elk Hill, uh, which was the home that Martha lived in with her first husband. Um, then he goes off into politics as a lawyer, even before he's uh, um, into politics, he's a lawyer and he's you know, out at Williamsburg a lot, at, you know, the general court, uh, practicing and going around. And then as a revolutionary, he's in Philadelphia and then he goes to Paris. I mean, he's away from home a lot. You think about Jefferson in relationship to Monticello, his reti the retirement years are the longest stretch of time that he spent in a plantation society in his life. The other times he's in, it's a huge stretch of time, five years is a lot uh, to be in Paris. Uh, he's in Philadelphia and his other places half the time. So he's longing for something that he doesn't, he has, but he doesn't have on a permanent basis, even the ideal family. Yeah, yeah. He loses his wife, and then he becomes the, you know, the father. He's a widower, he's a father to two, teen, to two girls. And when he's in Paris, sort of decrying their family life, which he hates, which scares the heck out of him, when he's in Paris, he's longing for this ideal family that he doesn't have anymore, and writing about it, and writing about its contours and so forth. And you just notice that you don't have this. You don't have a wife. You don't have this, you know, someone looking after you in that way. Right. Um, so it's, there's this sense of idealizing something and longing, and that's what we wanted to try to convey in the book, that a lot of what Jefferson is talking about, a lot of the things that he speaks of grow out of the sense of longing for it. And you can, it's palpable, yeah. you can tell. And that, that's the subtitle evokes that, we hope, that mm -hmm. empire of the imagination. We, we do tell a big story here, and I'm generally opposed to stories, uh, but this one came out, and I think it's <laughs> crucial to the story, uh, to the argument that we make about Jefferson. I'm into arguments. Uh, and that is, Jefferson wanted to get away from Virginia as a young man. It was a hopeless backwater in the British Empire. It was nowhere, and Williamsburg was uh, appropriately nowhere, capital of nowhere. He wanted to get out into the big world. He was impatient to get away from Virginia. Well, he couldn't. There was business to be done, and maybe Virginia could become a better place. He dedicated himself to the project of legal and constitutional reform in Virginia. He had great ambitions for the state. But for, for some reason, and we could mention taxation, among other things, and other sacrifices, the people weren't on board with Jefferson. Jefferson was deeply disappointed in his fellow Virginians and Americans in the way that almost stupid war, it worked out fine, I can reassure you, 
that we won our independence, but it didn't look too good in the immediate wake of the war. Uh, Jefferson's world was falling apart. He welcomed, after the death of his wife, and his political disappointments in Virginia. It's not just Hamilton who gave him a hard time. Just say another H word, Henry, Patrick Henry. Uh, Jefferson was not happy often in politics, but getting the opportunity to go represent the United States, that was the pivot of the story that we're telling here because when Jefferson was in France, he began to see everything differently including home in every sense of that word, his own house, which he began to say, you know, it's not satisfactory, I think I'll redesign it. His American home, that is, this place, America, has these wonderful possibilities that now became clear to him from his new position in France, looking back. It's another absence, that is, Jefferson's away from America, and America looks different. And one of the biggest changes we think, and uh, Annette took the lead on this, and I think this is one of our great contributions, is ironically or tragically, he had been committed to the principle of emancipation earlier on. That goes down in history as part of his legacy. Yet, as we have heard endlessly when people talk about, I'll say it, hypocrisy, he never did anything about it. Well, why not? You'd think when he went to France and saw how awful the old regime was, this would re-energize him to change things in America. But what did it do when it came to slavery? Well, it made him compare the situation in France with the United States. And he looked at the drastic, the incredible inequality uh, in French society, the enormous gap between rich and poor, uh, the pe the, he said that you know, the people were like an anvil to compare to the, the hammer of the people who were in control. And it had taken them many, many years to get to the point where there could be a rebellion. And in fact, he's there in pre-revolutionary France, a time that he act actually welcomes and continues to support uh, the French Revolution well into the 1790s, even after people had sort of run amok um, there. Uh, this vision of a sort of chaotic society, yeah. an old society, a society that's corrupt, a society whose family values, I mentioned women before, he was enormously upset about French women and their you know, participation in the public sphere. He hated Marie Antoinette. Uh, the idea was that women were supposed to, he calls them Amazons to angels, the angels of America, namely women who were domestic. Uh, women who tended to their husbands and their children. You remember I mentioned that he didn't have a wife at this point. This is a man who's talking about uh, this sort of idealized vision of, of, of a family life with a wife in a place where he thinks every single thing is chaotic and the sexual mores and all of these things he feels are just totally decadent and are frightening to him. And America begins to look better. You go to, you know, you can complain about your country, but you go to another country and you live and you see some things you like, but others you say, you know, that's, it's not so bad. Uh, our situation is not so bad. And at the same time, he has with him James and Sally Hemings. Um, James has been brought over, came over with him and his daughter Patsy, Martha called Patsy at the time, to be trained as a chef. And he's paying James wages. James, you know, is, has free movement, is going around by himself in Paris. When Sally Hemings comes, she is paid wages as well, um, there with the other uh, servants. And they become the face of slavery to him. Um, they were, to some degree, even before he left. But certainly, when you're in a place, if you think about language, for example, think about what it means. If you, he was never comfortable speaking French. If you're in a place with people who speak the same language that you do, how you feel differently about these folks. So, you know, you, you travel, uh, travel in Europe, people that you would, would never say two words to you if they're with you somewhere and you can talk to them, you, you feel different about them. And these people occupy a special place in his life because they are his wife's half siblings. So they are not like other enslaved people, yet they are enslaved. And he sees himself as a slave owner through how he treats them. And it's not the people down the mountain. So at once he becomes sort of a acclimates himself to this idea, accustoms himself to the idea of being a good master, that he can be a good master. Before he's talking about, in notes in the state of Virginia, he's describing uh, slavery, as Peter has written, 
uh, almost as a state of war between master and slave, that they're in conflict. The Jefferson who comes back from Paris comes back with the idea that he can ameliorate slavery. He can be a good master. He starts thinking about ways to have incentives instead of using the whip. It's not that the whip totally disappears in Monticello. I mean, it, it never does. But the idea is to lessen that, you pay people for things, pay people even if not for money, give people gratuities, whatever, to make them, make slavery better. Well, of course, once you do that, you make something better, you become mm -hmm. comfortable in it, and you're not opposed to it the way he was. So the combination of James and Sally Hemings, Sally Hemings in particular, um, and when he comes back, the rest of her family, all of these people, he sort of takes comfort in the idea that this is who he is as a slaveholder towards these people, not the folks down the mountain whom he has less contact with and does not know uh, intimately as he does uh, James and Sally and their siblings. And it's significant that Jefferson made his strongest statements against slavery in the midst of and the aftermath of a great war in which slaves were declaring their own independence mm -hmm. by escaping from his plantations. He lost some 30 slaves. Yeah. Uh, and uh, the idea then that this was no abstraction that that's a state of war between masters and slaves. It's a lived reality. It's an experience that Southerners have. And it's a scary one. The idea of servile insurrection is not just a paranoid fantasy, especially in a time of war when enslaved people can find allies and support from America's enemies, and that would be the British. Wars have historically been the moments in which slaves can strike for freedom, either individually or collectively. And this was happening to Jefferson. The world seemed to be in, on the verge of turning upside down. He uses the trope of the wheel of fortune turning. Mm -hmm. Wars, you don't know. It's like basketball games. You don't know who's going to win on any given day. Well, they take longer than that as a rule. But What's it could turn conference? against you. It could be black over white, uh, particularly if the insurgent slaves have allies they can call on. And what Annette is describing, this idea of amelioration or improvement, making it better, is what you have to do before the final reckoning comes. And I think that's the best way to think about Jefferson's plans to end slavery. He doesn't want another war, or he, doesn't, he dreads the possibility of another war, in which, at which time, then everything changes for him and his world. We have to make plans now, our fellow Virginians, to do something about this. What would it be? We need to, to, to decide collectively that we will do justice to these enslaved people. Slavery is unjust. How do we do that? We emancipate them, and then we find a country to send them to. We declare them a free and independent people. In other words, the thing that we find most horrible about Jefferson is his liberal solution to the problem of slavery, that is separation. We would say, use the language of deportation, sending people away as if they were criminals when they had been the victims of crime themselves. This is, this is uh, profoundly unsettling for us, but it was necessary, as Jefferson saw it, to separate these races or nations. The idea of race, nation, people, those ideas are all fluidly close to each other. They're interchangeable to some extent. And so when he's thinking in the long term, he's thinking about what must be done in the fullness of time, but we must do it collectively because we are enlightened. We recognize, on the one hand, the danger of having this population in our midst, and as enlightened, morally righteous people who are beginning to understand what is good and what is just, we want to work toward this end. And that's the great challenge. And you might say that's the tragedy of Jefferson's deeply flawed vision. It just wasn't going to happen. No, it's not going to happen. And by the end of his life, he realizes that it's crazy. You know, right. you're not going to be able to make all, send he all African Americans. He, he doesn't crazy. say, but I mean, the way he does these calculations and he's carrying on, and you know, and it says at some point, if it, if they don't don't come to a solution, black people are not going to go. They're going to say, mm -hmm. no, we're not going to leave. We're going to stay. And the interesting thing about this that is this 
you know, this notion that this is a liberal idea, but there was no sense at the time that blacks and whites, in Jefferson's mind and the minds of others, that black and white people could live together without conflict. And that's a dicey, you know, we say that that's a terrible notion, but it hasn't been, <laughs> hasn't been easy. Um, it's not like we haven't had the kinds of problems that he suggested. And I think that this is sort of a source of mm -hmm. a lot of, the, uh, most of the discomfort for Jefferson, the idea that he did not have faith in a multiracial society um, that we, I think, kid ourselves right. in some ways in thinking that we actually have. So I think that's, that's the fascinating thing to me about it is that you, so you sort of you get yourself into trouble when you create a paper trail uh, when you say things uh, that people write down and then people remember those. If he had never said those things, I mean, in the notes yeah. on the state of Virginia, the things that he thinks are gonna be problematic in notes in the state of Virginia, the stuff about slavery, that's not it. It's the stuff about race, it's all these other things that he's sort of thinking that, well, you know, this is the, this is the idea. Every, we, we left our nation, mm -hmm. our, our forefathers left our, their, our nation when they were upset and came and settled some other place they will do the same. How could they, how could black people love a country where they were treated in the way that they were treated? We're not gonna give up our prejudices and we're gonna end up fighting. But that's, that's the way, that's it. So the answer is that they have, we have to have this kind of separation. And so we're trying to do better than that and we've been trying to do better than that for a while and that's why he's, he's a problematic yeah. figure because yeah. we can't see that as a liberal solution, even though Marshall believed that, Monroe believed that, Madison believed that, Harriet Beecher Stowe believed that, Lincoln believed that. Uh, for some reason, the fixation is on Jefferson. I think it's probably because of the Declaration. Yeah. I mean, that, that document that has been right. you know, useful to lots of different people, lots of different groups, bringing them into American citizenship, that is the thing you associate him with, and so people are disappointed yeah. when he doesn't, when he's sort of talking in notes in the state of Virginia and other letters that are things that are sort of in contravention to it. And also, if you think about um, his, his life at Monticello, um, how some of the things, many of the things that he says in notes in the state of Virginia, um, you know, about blacks' intelligence and all of those things, he acts differently with the enslaved people. I mean, in the sense that he, you know, believes that some of them are more intelligent than others, it's pretty clear that he uses the talents of African American people in ways that would have to tell him that what he's saying in the notes aren't, you know, aren't real. But he's trying to be scientific. Yeah. And we're at a period when, you know, science is, science is the thing that inspires his imagination and gives him optimism, but it's also the dark side, as we say, of the right. Enlightenment, right. where you're categorizing people and you're categorizing things, and there must be a hierarchy, and he saw that in terms of race, clearly. That word faith is, I think, significant for us in this book, and I like the way Annette put it. He didn't have faith in what we take to be a given about what it is to be American, that diversity, the fact that it is a multi-ethnic, multi-racial, multi-sectarian society, and that's what's wonderful about it, and I think it is. But he had no faith in that. And he had a misplaced faith in his fellow white Virginians, imagining they would become more enlightened in the fullness of time. And it's an interesting commentary on the sense in which we today are disappointed in Jefferson because he didn't follow through on what we think is a self-evident truth that, as he put it, all men are created equal when if you reverse the telescope and look forward from Jefferson's time, he would have been very disappointed. He was very disappointed in the failure of enlightenment in Virginia. And we historians know that the enlightenment had its moment. It wasn't that the light would spread indefinitely until everything would be wonderful, but that was his you might even say his religion, the core of his faith in the conventional sense of the word. Things had to get better once you could discern God's design for creation. Mm -hmm. This is his deep belief. As we begin to figure things out, we see things. It's a, science is not at odds with ethics. They're 
exactly. Yeah, I think this yeah. is what you're suggesting. They're the same thing, mm -hmm. because that's the way God speaks to us to understand, as moral philosophers tried to do, natural philosophers tried to do, what God intended for his creation, what the design or even the intelligent design was for it, then you act accordingly. And this faith seems ridiculously naive. It's not clear that science and philosophy move naturally toward this enlightenment. And at what makes him seem most archaic, almost as archaic as that patriarch idea, mm -hmm. is that quaint faith in progress and enlightenment. And as I say, it's a, a wonderful irony or tragedy that we can turn around and accuse him of being a failure. Oh, we know he was a failure in many ways. There's a tension in his life, and I think you've been mm -hmm. great in pointing that out, between the way he imagines that his plantation world is an exception. Mm -hmm to that global idea of a war between the races. Oh, not on this plantation. And this is true of slave owners throughout the South. And particularly because he thinks that he is discharging his stewardship responsibility to his people and waiting for the time when something will be done and he hopes done voluntarily by his fellow Virginians. He was gonna have to wait a long time. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, and that belief in the difference in Monticello, I, we were saying that, I was thinking about um, um, Martha and, and Ellen, her daughter, are talking about after the Nat Turner rebellion. And Martha is completely, you know, oh, nothing's going to happen. You know, she, she mm -hmm. feels completely safe among the enslaved people yeah. around her. I, that not, they're not going to do anything because they thought that they were different. Um, because, uh, because of the way they treated um, enslaved people. Now, the enslaved people had a different view about that, obviously, but that's one of the, those are the kinds of stories that they told themselves. 